Hello, I'm Dr. Amy Orban, and today I'll be taking you through my paper, The Sisyphean Cycle of Technology Panics, published in Perspectives on Psychological Science. This lecture will give you a full overview of some of the main points in the paper, um, but do have a look at the paper if you think you want more details or citations or want a bit more nuanced reasoning. The paper is incredibly diverse. It spans a lot of different disciplines. It spans a lot of different technologies and different perspectives on the, what I think is a cycle of people being concerned about new technologies. Um, so what we'll be covering in this lecture is both the past, thinking about past concerns about technologies, the present, how we're reacting at the moment, and the future, both from a societal perspective um, a political perspective and a scientific perspective, um, thinking about what maybe scientists could do better um, to allow us to be more efficient in how we react to new technologies. But let's start all the way in the past, uh, in the 1940s. So in 1941, Mary Preston, who was a pediatrician working out of San Francisco and Stanford, published this article in the Journal of Pediatrics. She wrote about children's reactions to movie horrors and radio crime. So she was studying a, a group of children, about 100, 120, um, and how they reacted to listening to radio crime dramas on the radio or going to the movies and, and kind of seeing um, movies there. There wasn't any household television yet. And she made some pretty grave and, and quite important discoveries. Um, firstly, she found that these terrifying scenes, both on the radio and in movies, can have an inhibitory effect on, on the function of every organ in the body. She um, wrote in her paper that this kind of addiction to radio dramas and, and movie dramas would create bad dreams and poor sleep and really undesirable symptoms and make the child inadequate to meet life demands later on in life. And she really argued that this is a true addiction and that, mo that kind of the majority of the kids in her sample were severely addicted to these radio dramas and, and movie dramas and that most of them utilize this addiction as an escape from reality, much as a chronic alcoholic does drink. Naturally, now we, we find this sometimes even funny, um, these kind of grave concerns about the radio. Many parents would now be happy if their children spent significant amount of time listening to the radio instead of playing on their phones um, or, you know, on video games or on social media. But many parents now feel quite the same way. Um, we talk about smartphone addiction and social media addiction and how it's like having drugs and all these negative consequences. So this paper is both kind of an entertaining example, but also the first step of reflection. So why was this paper written in 1941? Well, the radio, for example, was going through a massive increase in popularity in that time. You see um, kind of this image from the Library of Congress um, showing people congregated around the radio in the home. And we see that in the US, households that had at least one radio really increased in the 1930s to the 1940s, from about 30 to, to 40 or 50 percent to 70 to 90 percent. So this is a massive increase in a short amount of time. So the radio was really causing some major changes uh, in how people live their lives. And also, the radio was causing major changes, how, how children live their lives. And it's often the leisure time of children that causes us the most concern. Um, children um, in the 1940s started spending about one to three hours of day, a day listening to the radio. So that's a significant chunk of leisure time that people are normally kind of quite attuned about what, what children are doing. So it's very similar to what we have now that the smartphone or social media has had explosive growth and has started taking up quite significant chunks of leisure time for children and changing the behavior of society as a whole. So I'll do a short quiz um, and just have a think about whether the quote I'm going, I show you uh, is about the radio or about smartphones. 
So the first is no locks will keep this intruder out, nor can parents shift their children away from it. So this is actually about the radio. Um, and it was said in 1935 by the director of the Child Study Association of America. Think about the next quote um, is, here is a device that is everywhere. We may question the quality of its offerings for our children. We may approve or deplore its entertainment and enchantment, but we are powerless to shut it out. It comes into our very homes and captures our children before our very eyes. Have a think. Yes, yeah, so this is also about the radio, actually from a parenting magazine in 1939. Even though I, when I give this as an actual lecture, there's often a 50-50 split in the room. And this is giving your child a blank is like giving them a gram of cocaine. Okay, this one's easier. So this is um, about the smartphone and I actually took it from a, a British newspaper headline from 2017. So what we have is sometimes in sociology, what we call a moral panic by Cohen, who wrote about this in the 1970s, um, that once these new technologies, these concerns of likening it to drugs and addiction could be seen as a moral panic. And these panics are worries that reach kind of a popular popularity in society um, when certain things are perceived as really challenging norms and values of what the society actually is. It often causes kind of societal leaders to speak out about these, saying that they're very worried, church leaders, politicians, teachers, and people kind of soul search. They try to figure out what this means. Interestingly, moral panics are often focused on the other, not the self. So the less powerful people in society, that can often be children, women, immigrants, people of color, um, and these concerns stay until they kind of disappear or trickle out. And we see this throughout society again and again, this doesn't need to be about technologies. But there's something more and the paper really tries to extend from saying, oh, well, this is just a moral panic to understanding, well, what drives these concerns? What are the societal, political and scientific factors? Because only if we really understand why we keep on getting concerned, we can maybe uh, do something about it. So the, the central tenet is that psychological panics are inherently cyclical. They seem to come again and again in similar ways, but always about a different technology at heart. You know, I'm not the first to say this. This has been known for a really long time. 1935, Grunberg wrote that looking backward, radio appears as but the latest of cultural emergence to invade the putative privacy of the home. Each such invasion finds the parents unprepared, frightened, resentful, and helpless. Within comparatively short time, the movie, the automobile, the telephone, the list goes on, <laughs> and the cheap paperback book have had similar effects upon the apprehensions and solicitudes of parents. We'd see this again and again. Um, in 1954, Wertham wrote a really strong book saying that comic books was causing youth violence. Youth violence has really been a problem for a really long time. It didn't really, but in the 1950s, it flared up. But then in, in 1980s, there was another flare up of youth violence. And now it was television that seemed to be causing youth violence. And there was a US media task force to investigate these links. And last summer, at least in the UK, we had um, kind of an uproar in, in youth stabbings, and for example, in London. And then YouTube and social media and grime music were blamed for youth violence. So we see an ongoing problem being easily linked to the new technology of the time. However, so this is now a cyclical kind of cycle of technology panics um, that seems to restart again and again for centuries. You know, we could probably trace it back to romance novels, the printing press, writing, um, et cetera. But I feel like that in the last century, something has really changed. And that's the role of science, the role of a person like me, researching these kind of technologies, trying to figure out what policy might be able to do. And the role of science has increased in quite an exponential way. 
So for example, there was a panic about bicycles, women on bicycles. And there were a couple of articles in the New York Times that you could kind of try to find where um, medics mostly were saying that there were some grave consequences due to bicycles. But it was only, you know, a couple of people and not like a concerted effort of the field. With the radio, we already see some actual scientific articles being published, people being worried and saying that in the scientific literature. But again, it's only a handful of people. With comic books, Friedrich Wertham actually wrote a whole book. So there's already started to be more of an influence of science, scientists trying to grapple with these issues. And then it really increased. So television, we had full kind of teams of researchers going in. Uh, it was some of the first real governmental, big governmentally funded studies uh, into this technology. With video games, we have whole research fields, editors of big journals, um, you know, and probably hundreds of researchers. And I think with smartphones and social media now, this has only increased. Um, I feel like every day I meet somebody new who is studying social media or smartphones. And so we've really kind of, what has changed is really a huge increase in scientific involvement in these debates. This brings me to Jerry Rabbit's ideas of the industrialization of science. Why are scientists more and more looking at new technologies and their effect on society? Well, there's quite a few different reasons. Um, I do recommend reading his book, but there's, um, I'll go back actually, the, the uh, in an industrial state of science, more and more scientists are not kind of funded by philanthropists or by kind of big pots of money, but we need to compete against smaller pots of money given by government and research councils, often to solve concrete problems in society. So it's becoming more problem focused. It's come, becoming bigger. There are more and more scientists and there's more and more competition for these funding pots. So actually a focus on technology panics is quite interesting because one, there are funding pots available, society is concerned, and now kind of there's more funding there. Scientists go in, they try to solve this problem, use the funding, and that kind of helps their careers as well. And in the last century, we've also seen that more and more people want science to be done. The more and more policy wants scientific evidence, kind of evidence-based policy is a, is a holy grail. So there are fewer areas of life where kind of common sense wisdom is now valued more than scientific evidence. A century ago, about, you know, problems about parenting or questions about child rearing were still mainly something for religious leaders, families, or communities to think about. But now people look towards science for these issues, kind of problems or solving the problems. So we as scientists now operate in a real industrialized scientific space where we're workers kind of working for funding, expected to solve these practical problems in society that people want information about. And this will become crucial in later parts of the paper. But let's go to kind of the title of the paper again. We've now done a long introduction about some of the core ideas that we'll use um, now to think about the Sisyphean cycle of technology panics. The name comes from King Sisyphus, um, a Greek king that kind of, in, in short, ousted the gods. He thought he was better than the gods. He tricked them. And so at the very end, they got so exasperated, they, they put him at this hill uh, in the underworld, making him a roller stone up the hill. Um, and only once he reaches the very top, thinking he's actually figured it out, he's rolled the boulder up the hill, it rolls down again. He has to go back down and and kind of start rolling it up again. And he actually does this for eternity. This is a never ending cycle. So why do I name my cycle of technology panics the Sisyphean cycle of technology panics? Because I, I think we might be in a similar situation. So instead of the king and the underworld, scientists kind of do a lot of work trying to figure out a new technology that people are concerned about they roll a boulder up the hill. As a society as well, we're trying to figure something out, but we never actually reach the top. Always once we're almost done figuring things out, a new technology comes around. People are actually more interested now about smartphones than video games or television. 
and the cycle restarts. We never really get anywhere in actually understanding what technologies do to us or our children. So the cycle itself and how I've laid it out has um, different stages. So four in total. There's the first, which is kind of the psychological reaction from the population and society, which creates a panic about a new technology. The second is the political reaction to that population, uh, to the electorate, and what politicians do in trying to figure out kind of what to do about this technology panic, moving it on to science, outsourcing it to science. So the third is then the scientific community trying to figure out the new technology, um, kind of often reinventing the wheel with every new technology and therefore not getting very far. And so we end up at step four, which is no progress, new panic, where we actually had very little progress, putting policymakers in front of some very difficult decisions that we'll talk about later. And where often the cycle just restarts because a new technology comes around. Nobody cares about the old technology. The funding dries out, the scientists move on. And so we've kind of then go back into the cycle again, forgetting about radios and televisions and comic books um, and kind of focusing just on the newest technology at hand. So I'll go through the steps one by one. The first is panic creation. So as I said, this is about the kind of psychological factors that might drive all of us to be concerned about a new technology that becomes popular throughout society and maybe surpasses a certain threshold of popularity. And an idea that helps, at least helped me conceptualize this is technological determinism. So this is this kind of universal human outlook to technologies that we often think that technologies are the basic and fundamental drivers of changes in society. They're powerful things that change us, change how we work and function, um, but that we cannot change back. So it's kind of a one-way street of technologies influencing us and we cannot do anything about it. And that they're often some of the biggest changes and drivers of change in society at the time. Technological determinism, this kind of feeling of technology as being so powerful and so powerful to change things, makes it easy to link new technological kind of changes to other changes in society. For example, decreases in mental health, something that's very long term might be linked to a short term increase in a certain technology like social media or the economy or the way youth kind of react, youth violence. Something interesting currently is something like a, the COVID pa pandemic being linked to 5G. Again, we see a very kind of societal trend that has complicated origins uh, being linked to a very simple technological reason. Okay, so um, we have this panic creation. Technological determinism influences how we think. That, in, that then also causes a moral panic. We kind of talked about at the beginning of the talk. Um, and so now we have a, a society that is very concerned. Naturally then politicians feel like they need to do something. And actually a lot of people have argued that politicians benefit out of these societal panics again and again and again. Politicians have used people's concerns about new technologies to show that they're standing up to technology companies that are emerging, whether that's TV companies or social media companies or video game producers, to demonstrate that they're really concerned about children or vulnerable populations. And crucially, by, for example, kind of saying that they're going to target social media companies and that this will improve mental health. This allows them to deflect attention from more difficult or uncomfortable issues in society. Maybe kind of things that their previous government um, put in like cuts in youth mental health services or, or children's center and austerity um, or problems with their electorate pressure put on children from parents um, or kind of a mixture of the two. Actually, instead of blaming kind of your own government or blaming the voters, it's a lot more easier to blame an emerging technology company people are concerned about anyways. And we see this again and again, the UK health secretary here, Matt Hancock, 
often gets very positive coverage when he says that, you know, he'll stand up to places like Instagram and that this will help um, solve some youth mental health crises. While maybe and possibly very much so, um, kind of general systematic change in youth mental health services, education, children's senses, reversing austerity, all of these would be just as effective or probably even more so. So politics and science often seem separate but are actually inherently interlinked and we need to think about this link to know what place we as scientists play. Science um, in the way that kind of Jerry Rabbit thinks about these things in the industrialization of science provides reassurance and comfort to a population. It allows to kind of calm fears and, and kind of figure things out to help inform policy. And so politicians and policymakers, once a concern flares up, their reaction is often to kind of outsource this problem by saying that they're gonna fund research, they're gonna commission work, and then referencing research in their own talks and, and policies. So this kind of outsourcing process is really positive um, for a lot of scientists. It means kind of funding, which we all need to survive, it means prestige, interests from the media, and naturally the personal thing of being studying something that you know, you're personally interested in, um, means that studying a new technology is really aligned with incentives. Um, and so I think that's why we see so many researchers now going into this space, studying kind of technological change. However, there's a major problem because studying a societal issue is very different to kind of the traditional ways of scientific progress. Often science progresses by people studying a universal kind of scientific theory that guides research. So for example, you have a theory and then you test a certain aspect in a very controlled study and then figure out whether kind of it holds or it doesn't and then you progress um, the research field. This is very different in science about a societal problem because there is no theory, there's no overarching thinking about it. You see that with the introductions of papers in this field, you know, mine as well, they're often like loads of people use this technology and people are really worried so we studied it, you know, or Loads of people use this technology and there's fears of addiction, so we studied it, which is very different to somebody conceptualizes a theory and we're gonna test this in this certain case, or we're gonna try to extend it, or we're gonna try to disprove it. And this brings us to the third part of the cycle, which is wheel reinvention. I think that this lack of theory um, and the streaming in of many researchers into a space where there's very little guidance, theoretical and methodological guidance, is really problematic and leads to a really ineffective and inefficient field. We know that it's quite ineffective and inefficient because research seems to, you know, the same research questions seem to be answered for every new technology. And again, I'm not the first person to say this. In the 1950s, Sego said that, you know, for technological research, we seem to go through the same stages. They seem to always be the same questions. Uh, for example, about technology addiction, concentration, empathy. So we often overlook that maybe um, the new technologies share more similarities and differences and overlook that to really have scientific progress that doesn't kind of restart with every new technology and doesn't forget everything that was done before. We need to consider previous research on other technologies to inform our new research on new technologies. So we come to that problem. How do we create a kind of linear progression of research in a research field without scientific theory to guide it? And without scientific theory to guide it, there are huge problems. Kuhn wrote about kind of pre-paradigmatic fields of science and I may be over extrapolating his thinking, but he said that without an underlying paradigm to guide research, each researcher is forced to build his or her field anew from its foundation. That's kind of a major place of inefficiency. Further, he notes that in a pre-paradigmatic field, this time is marked by frequent and deep debates over legitimate methods, problems, and standards of solutions, though these serve rather to define schools than to produce agreement. So he said that it's not only ineffective and inefficient to not have a theoretical foundation 
so that everybody needs to build their own. He said that by building their own, actually scientific progress often doesn't allow us to reach a unified conclusion, but creates schools of thought. So over time, different schools of thought emerge that have different methodological standards, different theoretical standards. And actually, if there's no theoretical paradigm that guides it, no unified theoretical paradigm, they will just be in disagreement <laughs> for a long time. And we see this again in the technological literature, for example, in video games, in this review by Malta Elson and Chris Ferguson, after 25 years of research into video games, they say that actually, you know, there are two camps that are battling it out. And it, and, you know, probably in 25 years time, they'll still be battling it out. We just see the same for social media. Um, so actually it's really hard to build a scientific consensus if there's no underlying theory. Naturally, in the paper, I go through some possible theories that might help, but I do think that we don't have an underlying theory in a, in a field that is actually built on a societal problem, about solving something for society, which causes a really inefficient process. So we come to the last step of the cycle, which is no progress, new panic. We've covered the societal kind of population level forces, the political forces and the scientific forces. So what do we now do at the end of the cycle where actually what we want to do is create powerful and effective policy to ensure that a new technology has benefits for society and to control it in you know, very beneficial ways. However, if you're a policymaker or a politician after this cycle, you actually don't have a lot of options. Uh, Hamelink actually proposes that there's um, different ways in which you could do policy about a new technology. So the first is retrospective work. So looking at the past to inform the future. But this is really difficult because you often cannot use the past to inform the future in technology research and technology policy because the past is just too different. You cannot predict the future from the old technology. The second is formative work. So kind of on the go when a new technology is rolled out, studying it and kind of making policy at the same time. But technology, technological change is now accelerating and is extremely fast and science is really slow. <laughs> and so this also won't work because technological change outpaces science at you know, multiple miles per hour. The third option he said is risk judgment. So kind of cost benefit analyses. But if we don't actually have good information about a new technology, it's hard to think about the costs and the benefits and weigh them up in a good way. The fourth is prospective work. So kind of thinking about what the future might bring. Again, probably not the best because technological change is so fundamental in the current kind of digital revolution we're in that it's very hard to predict what's gonna come next. So the fifth is actually what we often kind of subscribe to, this summative evaluation, kind of collecting the evidence on the go. And once we figured enough out, kind of evaluate it and make policy, even if that's kind of years behind the technology itself. However, naturally this is problematic because policy is behind the technological change. Um, and this really um, kind of makes some big problems because of technological entrenchment. So technological entrenchment is that over time, a technology entrenches in society and it makes it harder and harder to change. And this technological entrenchment has accelerated in the last decades. You know, social media has now become a staple in society over just a decade. TikTok has come in and really caused kind of a major uptake in just a year. Um, and Colin Ridge wrote really well about this saying that by the time a technology is sufficiently well-developed and diffused for its unwanted social consequences to become apparent, it is no longer easily controlled. Control may still be possible, but it has become very difficult, expensive, and slow. That's because once it's actually diffused in society, people are using it, people have built their livelihoods on it. I don't think we could roll back social media. We're only kind of now patching it up on the go. So actually, if we want to make really effective policy, we need to make it very, very quickly. <laughs> but then science isn't really there yet. So this kind of is what causes the major issue in this space, at least 
in my belief. I talked to this to a policymaker at Cambridge off the record, um, and they said that I got this all wrong, you know, because I was focusing on evidence-based policy. And actually, policy doesn't need to be evidence-based. It doesn't need to wait for the scientific consensus. It just needs to be evidence-focused. And so it could well be developed kind of before the scientific consensus itself. And I think we've seen this now in the COVID-19 crisis a lot of scientists actually trying, needing to make decisions before they actually know 100% what's going on. And this has come across a lot in the kind of literature and the philosophical literature about tech policy. That maybe technology policy, because science is slow and the evidence will always come too late to battle technological entrenchment, maybe the policy just needs to be a gamble. You need to maybe sit scientists in a room on a sort of technological kind of science court and have them make a decision on their incomplete scientific evidence, create a policy from that, and then kind of spend a lot of money and time actually evaluating that policy. So by saying that any policy we make about technologies might be a gamble or is a gamble and therefore might be wrong, we should then create kind of a new field evaluating that policy instead of waiting for the scientific consensus to make the policy in the first place. However, we're still not there yet. I don't think we've seen kind of really effective policy on social media or smartphones. Um, and so there's still a lot of development that needs to be done to really understand what is the interplay of science and policy and politicians and the public in a time of technological revolution where change is really, really rapid. So what we come to is that often there is no big policy revelation. There is no big scientific consensus about a new technology. What instead happens is, an, is another technology comes along, a newer technology, something even newer than social media, that people that kind of becomes popular in society reaches a certain threshold, and all of a sudden people are concerned about that, and they forget about their concern about the last technology, which causes the cycle to restart, the boulder rolls down the hill, we kind of forget our interest on kind of the past technology, often forget the research that was done on that, and the cycle restarts. So this is my kind of quick overview of the Sisyphean cycle of technology panics. And I want to end on kind of trying to think about what we could do. You know, are we just trapped in the Sisyphean cycle um, and we cannot, cannot escape? And I think both yes and no. I think breaking a cycle like this with many different forces will need concerted effort from a lot of different spaces policy, politicians, scientists, funders, the public. So if I'm just talking to scientists, we actually cannot break the cycle, but at least we can focus our efforts on certain things. And I think this is mainly part three and four of the cycle. We cannot change the psychology of new technologies causing concern or politicians using them for benefit, but maybe we can make our field more effective and efficient and rethink policymaking and the interplay of science and policy to improve that as well. So looking at step three, we would want to minimize wheel reinvention and probably do this by one, kind of thinking about how we can create better theory. I think that's really hard because creating a whole theoretical framework from scratch at, for a field that's already existing is probably almost impossible. But what we can focus on is improving agreement on methodology, for example, through open science principles, or accelerating scientific progress. That could be funders funding longitudinal data collection on a new technology before people come concerned about it. For example, funding work on augmented or virtual reality today, rather than in a couple of years when, when concern has reached its peak and it's too late um, to really collect that data. Or accelerating scientific progress in other ways that will then allow us to better communicate with stakeholders. And I've put together a small framework to really think through personally what I think might allow us to accelerate our scientific progress. And that's the United Framework for Technology Research. I'll go through it one by one. So the first, the un, <laughs> is unique use. So we need to think about that technologies 
um, really have a lot of unique uses. Just social media can be anything from looking at self-harm images for 20 minutes to kind of video chatting to somebody for 20 minutes or chatting them over text or looking at celebrities, pictures. And so we need to consider these unique uses straight away. Often when we research a new technology, we oversimplify or overgeneralize this technology, We're saying kind of social media use as a whole or video gaming as a whole. But actually, I think that going towards the unique uses more quickly will help accelerate our progress. The second is that the effects of technologies will be highly individual. Again, at the beginning of technology research and a new technology, we often oversimplify and overgeneralize on the people side as well. We look at all children or all users or all adolescents. But actually, we know that the effects of these things in our lives, these technologies, are highly individual um, and that this should be kind of looked at. And so this is often looking at, for example, longitudinal work, within person changes, looking at individual differences, um, and, and really taking those seriously. If we do longitudinal work, we really need to think about the time frame. Um, we often just do maybe an annual study, and then we look at the technology predicting outcomes on an annual basis. But do we really believe that kind of, for example, using your smartphone will affect your concentration one year later or your, your well-being one year later? Maybe it's every minute and we need to do a short-term study or every hour or every day. So we really need to think about that time frame um, and try to capture the actual effect we're interested in. Again, much earlier in the research progress. The fourth is to think about effect size. What size of effect is actually important for policy? How can we communicate that? How can we figure out causal links to make sure that the effect size actually matters? Um, and I think, again, we need to spend a lot more time thinking about effect sizes. And the fifth is direction. And this links to effect sizes and the longitudinal work again, is that often at the beginning, it's mainly correlational work. And we often assume that a correlation is kind of a substitute for a causal effect of the technology on the outcome, probably because of technological determinism, because we see the technology as a driver of change. But we now know from a lot of research that actually we also affect our use of the technology. So the outcome could affect the technology use or another factor affects the both. Technology now sits in a very complicated network of factors of everyday life um, that really both affect our behavior and our outcomes. And so we really need to think about what these correlations and also kind of longitudinal relations we find actually mean. Um, and what we, they can do to inform policy. So in this talk, I kind of did a whistle-stop tour of my paper, The Sisyphean Cycle of Technology Panic, arguing that yes, technology research is in a kind of almost never-ending cycle of concern driven by societal factors, political factors, scientific factors, and an ineffective interplay between science and policy. However, I think by laying this out, we can one, maybe discuss about whether I'm right, <laughs> um, and two, think about how we can do things better, because I don't think we're doing things the right way. For example, I don't think we've had a truly harmful technology enter children's lives yet. But in a time of technological change, it's not a matter about if a, if a harmful technology gets developed. It's a matter about when it does. And we need to have the right mechanisms in place to locate that and kind of target that and have policy for that in a very rapid scale, time scale. I don't think we have that yet. So thank you for listening to my talk. Um, and then, yeah, I hope you enjoy reading the paper. <laughs>